My name is Mike Peach. I'm Vice President and General Manager of the Cloud Storage and Data Services Business Unit at Red Hat. And I am super excited to be here with you all today. I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can accelerate your artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, projects and efforts and initiatives with Open Hybrid Cloud. So let me jump right in. So I always try to situate a talk like this within some current context. And sometimes that can be a little, a little difficult, a little, a little, you know, contrived, let's say. In this case, we actually have a really fascinating event, series of events underway right now that uh, is just absolutely rich with um, inspiration and starting points to talk about data, data engineering, data science, artificial intelligence, machine learning. So unless you're just completely uh, off grid, you can't not have heard uh, that uh, a very large ship was stuck in the Suez Canal uh, for a number of days last week. Uh, it is called the Ever Given, stuck here in the Suez Canal in Egypt. This ship is uh, 1,300 feet plus long, almost 200 feet wide, 220,000 tons. It carries 20,000 containers each, ranging from 20 to 40 tons. A very, very big ship. Now, it happens to be stuck, or happened to have been stuck, in a very important, a very strategic location. The Suez Canal uh, connects the uh, basically the uh, the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, and uh, just as is very well depicted in this uh, graphic here, it cuts uh, nearly a third off of the journey between Europe and Asia. Let's pick two significant ports, such as Rotterdam and Singapore. Let's, uh, let's just look at a couple of quick statistics. 80% of the import-export volume, the trade in the world goes by ships, 50% by value. 1.5 tons per year per person on the planet. A lot of stuff moves by ships. The Suez Canal, 120 miles long, owned by the Egyptian government. Um, 50 ships a day go through this, again, strategic location. $9 billion worth of goods per day, 13% of the world's trade goes through this strategic location. Now, uh, I, as I was learning about this over the last couple of days, uh, this particular image just struck me um, for among other reasons, the sheer difference in scale between old technology and new technology is often just mind blowing, overwhelming. Now this particular incident ended uh, reasonably well. Yesterday, the uh, ship was in fact floated through a lot of amazing engineering, um, as well as a little help from, uh, from Mother Nature with some spring tides on the, over the weekend on Sunday. Um, but a very important takeaway here, and really this is the setup, is that data can help. Data did help, data will help. Data is involved and relevant and critical, both for preventing things like this and in helping deal with them when they inevitably do happen. Data data engineering and data science are all critical. Now, if we just think about this whole scenario, what happened with this ship, its impact on world trade, on world business, and we start to think about some of the different kinds of data that came into play. It's mind blowing, right? So just the, the ship itself, right? It got stuck because of a sandstorm and 70 mile an hour winds that blew a 220,000 ton ship slightly off course in a very narrow, very strategic canal and blocked shipping, blocked nine, the flow of $9 billion worth of goods a day for on the order of six days. You had the tidal information, oceanographic, you have now ship scheduling and ship routing as, as uh, different um, transport companies around the world were scrambling, trying to figure out how to deal with this thing. You've got fuel considerations, both for the ships and the fuel that the ships were carrying from various places around the world. You have so many different kinds of specialists and their scheduling and availability, specialists to pilot the ship, specialists to dredge the ship out, specialists uh, in um, re-optimizing and rerouting uh, 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 various uh, trade routes and so on. You've got raw material 
supply and demand at a local or sort of more tactical level. You've got macroeconomic factors, black swan events, blah, blah, blah. It just becomes quickly overwhelming how many different kinds of data uh, come into play in situations like this. And this doesn't matter whether you're the operator of the ship, whether you're uh, the seller of uh, goods that are being transported by the ship, you're the operator of a port. There are just so many ramifications, so many implications, so many percussions of an event like this, all of which can be significantly uh, improved and aided with uh, the right use of data. So clearly data, critical asset, and depending on what type of industry you're in, it can be used in different ways. It can improve a customer experience. It can allow businesses to gain competitive advantage. It could be about a P&L, profit and loss, uh, cost savings. Uh, it can be about automation, et cetera. And in different vertical domains, in different types of business, uh, there are clearly even more subdomains and, and specific ways along the lines of some of those things I just mentioned, um, where data can be brought to bear and machine learning more significantly, more recently, can be brought to bear in very helpful and very um, uh, important ways, uh, whether it's in healthcare, faster, better diagnosis, risk analysis and financial services, um, optimizing network routing within telecommunications, um, how uh, insurance premiums are calculated, et cetera. Now, an important consideration to keep in mind is that operationalizing the use of data, the employment of data, whether it's for um, really basic artificial intelligence, let's say simple rules-based systems, whether it's more advanced, actual, um, modern, sophisticated learning algorithms, uh, putting all of this together is not trivial. There's a lot of limelight, there's a lot of discussion about uh, specific algorithms and specific technologies. Um, the true science-y stuff is very exciting for sure and, and, and certainly a great impact here, but we also need to not forget all of the seemingly more boring stuff that it takes to get all the right kinds of data to the right places at the right time so that models can be trained, so that uh, trained models can be deployed, so that there's a feedback loop, so that there is the, the right, um, call it plumbing, so that a fast iterative uh, uh, cycle can be uh, set up so that learning can really do what it needs to do and in a timely manner. So if you just look at some of the roles of uh, of, of the stakeholders involved and some of the phases uh, of a machine learning or more generally artificial intelligence employment of data, it is quite complex, right? At the executive level, you're setting high level business goals. You've got data engineers that are gathering and preparing data, putting all of the right platform, the right infrastructure in place to get, again, those various kinds of data to the right place at the right time so that data scientists can then actually sit down and work with models, work with new algorithms, train models, et cetera. But then you have, in addition to data scientists, you've got folks in big companies, small companies, medium companies who are uh, the ones that actually take that output from the data scientists uh, and again, put them in production, put them to work. Uh, you've got the work of the machine learning engineers and the data scientists being pulled together into larger applications that are being built by more general software engineers, not necessarily artificial intelligence or machine learning experts per se, but all of these different uh, types of application building stakeholders need to be able to collaborate together to get an actual full-blown application out and in production. And then ultimately you've got the ops folks. Now, whether you're running an application in a public cloud or, or on your own premises in a data center, um, you've got folks that need to keep the lights on, need to keep everything up and running, need to handle backups and restores and, and, and all of that good stuff. Um, so let's quickly. Uh, so we've, we've talked about uh, a couple of challenges already, but let's just highlight a couple of additional ones, right? So the data itself, as we 
already touched on with the shipping example, there's the volume, variety, and velocity of different kinds of data uh, is of a scale that is like never before. And that is overwhelming old ways of handling data, right? So to do modern machine learning, one needs different architectures from what one needed in the past. Um, as with anything new, you've got uh, it, it, a scarcity of expertise to deal with this. Um, the tools, many of the tools are, are brand new, they're nascent, uh, so there's not as established, um, uh, let's say, learning and training around these things. So if we look at the architecture and some of the technologies that it takes to address some of these challenges that we just discussed, um, right, if we take that workflow of setting goals, gathering, preparing data, developing models, etc., we have tools that many of you are familiar with, such as TensorFlow, Spark, Jupyter Notebooks, etc. Uh, we have <clears throat> more, let's say, infrastructural type augmentation of that or support for that with data pipelines uh, and various data constructs, such as data lakes. Now, at the center of all of this, the next layer down, the platform layer that that is critical for enabling the kinds of speed, the kinds of scale, uh, the kinds of reliability that we need to do the kinds of application development and, and, and running of machine learning uh, enhanced applications in production. This is where a cloud platform, this is where containers and the architecture that containers enable, such as microservices, fine-grained modularity, et cetera. This is what is fundamentally enabled by uh, t a technology like Kubernetes and its instantiation and its embodiment in the commercial product uh, OpenShift. Um, that is itself enhanced and augmented with uh, technologies at an even lower layer, such as graphics processing units, um, floating point gate arrays, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, field programmable gate arrays, uh, uh, the tensor processing units, various new types of hardware basically to accelerate the right kinds of uh, elements in the kinds of algorithms that we're talking about here. Um, and then all of that is available to enterprises in various um, infrastructure models, whether it's physical on-premises, virtualized, um, completely private, um, public cloud, hybrid. And a theme that you'll see in some of what we talk about here is that everything is increasingly hybrid. So now, with all of that background, let's take a look at a couple of examples, three in fact, from three different industry verticals. Um, we'll start with financial services. So Royal Bank of Canada, top 10 bank in the world, uh, been around for a fairly long time, uh, 86,000 employees, lots of branches, um, a big bank. We started working with them uh, about five years ago. They were looking to create a general machine learning capability, a data science capability uh, to enhance a number of different areas of their business, fraud detection, risk analysis, even marketing. They made some initial uh, attempts and some of the challenges they experienced as they were first setting up the team of on the order of 100 folks, um, they were finding that uh, projects took two months to get off the ground. Um, the platforms were hard to build. The, the, just the sheer wiring together of the various technologies um, at, uh, at the disposal of the engineers was just itself very time consuming and distracting and taking away from the time to actually build the applications. Um, and security and compliance were, were challenges as well. They had a goal. They wanted to set up tools and processes for 100 developers and engineers. Um, they obviously wanted to take that two month uh, project cycle down significantly. They realized that part of their challenge was, was actually culture, was that the old planning waterfall ways of uh, doing application development were not well suited to the rapid iterative type development that one needs to employ in training models and in using machine learning effectively as part of applications. 
So they uh, they worked with uh, Red Hat and NVIDIA, um, in addition to some other technologies. They employed Red Hat OpenShift and NVIDIA uh, GPUs to accelerate um, machine learning models. Um, they, uh, their architecture taking advantage of Kubernetes and the, the container architecture of OpenShift employed a, a very fine grain architecture to deploy machine learning models in containers so that they could get that rapid iterative uh, uh, structure to their process. They uh, were um, particularly because of regulatory uh, constraints and so on wanted to set this up in a sort of on-premises you know their own data center. Um, the NVIDIA technology was significant in speeding up uh, what was initially um, you know some performance challenged uh, applications there. So the results uh, they took, uh, they were able to, they've, they've already done on the order of a thousand models with uh, the setup they've built over the last couple of years. They were able to do 10 times more experiments per unit time than they were able to do with their earlier setup. They took that two month window, that two month life cycle for projects down to a number of days. Um, and in one particular example of a project, uh, they were able to, um, analyze the records of 13 million of their Canadian customers in, in 20 minutes. And given the complexity of the calculation going on there, that's actually a pretty phenomenal number. So let's, uh, let's jump to a different vertical, a different domain, um, and with certainly different drivers and different constraints, healthcare. So HCA Healthcare, private healthcare company based in the US, uh, also been around for 50 plus years. A uh, couple hundred hospitals, 2,000 care sites across the U.S. and as well uh, in the U.K. Um, $50 billion in revenue, number 67 and Fortune 500. So a big healthcare organization here in the U.S. 280,000 employees. Healthcare um, in terms of uh, employees per um, unit of work or per revenue, et cetera, it tends to be a, a very um, sort of people intensive business. They set out to address a particular challenge. Now, we've all, um, in, in learning about machine learning and artificial intelligence in general, uh, diagnosis of medical conditions is a use case that comes up fairly frequently. And it's fairly intuitive, fairly easy to get one's head around how uh, one can throw machine learning at uh, the basic problem of, input set of symptoms, output set of possible medical conditions. They were addressing in particular the disease called sepsis, which is uh, a disease where uh, a person's immune system overwhelmingly um, reacts, essentially over rotates in response uh, to an infection to the point where that immune response starts to actually do more harm than good. It literally damages organs in the, in the body. Um, so it's a it's a it's a disease that, uh, among other uh, characteristics, it's it it spreads and it um, it does its damage very quickly. So time to diagnose is absolutely critical. In uh, HCA uh, hospitals and and facilities, the diagnosis of sepsis was a very manual process. Literally, nurses with clipboards, um, and the knowledge about how to diagnose it was also spotty. There was better knowledge in some places than others, and that needed to be, uh, that needed to be well addressed. So they, again, HCA set out to address this very specific problem uh, to automate uh, and normalize this uh, diagnosis across all of their vast properties um, and give every possible uh, diagnosis instance the benefit of the, the best possible, you know, diagnostic technology, diagnostic knowledge, right? So, you know, smooth out that spikiness and, and not let, you know, some patients be, you know, worse off than others because they happen to be in a place with, with less knowledge. Uh, so they uh, employed uh, OpenShift uh, and set up an environment where their data scientists could um, gather their existing data, set up an initial model, um, roll it out to an application that nurses and uh, doctors would use instead of those clipboards and the, the previous much more uh, manual process. Um, 
and they significantly uh, sped up and improved the results of diagnosis of sepsis. Um, and here's a, a quote from the, the chief data scientist at HCA. They provide a five-hour head start. Uh, there's um, there's a great video that's uh, that's linked with an interview that talks about every um, uh, so, so every hour is uh, of delay in diagnosing sepsis uh, increases the odds or the, the risk of, of of death by four to seven percent. So hours really is the, the difference between life and death here. And this is just a, a fantastic example of how with the right kind of um, infrastructure supporting data science, how it can be rolled out on a mass scale and really, really help humanity. Okay, third, third use case here. Let's look at automotive manufacturing. So BMW Group, uh, everybody's I'm sure, you know, heard of and, and seen BMWs on the road. Eighth largest automaker in the world, been around for, you know, over 100 years. Um, they roll out two and a half million cars a year. Now, BMW has always prided itself on its image of innovation, right? They made the first, their first electric car in 1972. So as an innovative, technology-minded, technology-oriented company, it's clear that these uh, th this is a company that's going to um, want to make the best use of emerging uh, data capabilities, data science, machine learning. Um, so today on the road, there are 1.4 billion cars, 250 million of them are connected. Um, every major car company in the world is working on autonomous driving. Um, you know, basically auto manufacturers are becoming Internet of Things manufacturers, right? It's not just about um, commuting or, or, or transportation or getting from A to B. It is about an experience, a connected experience. Now, BMW wanted to uh, manage, so they have a, a program called Connected Drive. So if you happen to be an owner of a late model um, BMW, you're probably familiar with their Connected Drive uh, application um, allows you to do everything from uh, you know navigation to scheduling maintenance to you know ordering a pizza while you're on the road. Um, there are uh, a billion connected drive requests per week, um, and of course BMW is wanting to constantly roll out new services, new capabilities to stay ahead of the competition, to provide an awesome experience for their drivers, and so on. So they uh, have um, they they have put uh, an OpenShift based uh, infrastructure in place to enable their application builders, their data scientists, to uh, uh, develop again these new services um, and be constantly iterating in that sort of rapid innovation, rapid trial and error uh, type approach to to rolling out new services. Um, and they also realized that they had to adopt a more DevOps uh, type of culture, right? That in, in transforming from that sort of, you know, pre-connected world to the assumption, the expectation that every car out there is, is going to be connected, um, their whole software development organization had to be itself transformed. So again, solution based on OpenShift, uh, they uh, they developed the D3 data driven development platform to uh, to throw out the massive amounts of data being generated already by by their cars out there. Um, this was uh, all built using the latest uh, cloud native architecture, microservices, etc., uh, on top of OpenShift, and uh, with uh, a, a partner uh, development company called DXC. Uh, they have really taken this. Uh, this whole initiative over the last five years uh, to an amazing new level. Um, here's a quote from uh, the, the chief architect of that partner DXC. Um, you know, this just, uh, with the right level of analysis and efficiency would take literally millions of years of effort. Um, you know, when you start to think about what gets short circuited by throwing machine learning at a problem versus having humans figure it out, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Okay, so we've walked through three different example use cases of how uh, a hybrid cloud infrastructure has helped companies or organizations in those three different uh, industry verticals uh, significantly 
improve or augment uh, their offerings, their customer experiences, et cetera. Um, so all of that has been, uh, what I've gone through already has all been developed on OpenShift, again, that Kubernetes-based cloud platform. So I wanna talk about real quickly here in my last uh, couple of minutes is a project called Open Data Hub. So this is an open source project. If you go to opendatahub.io, uh, you'll see what it's all about. Um, and in short, I mean, as said here, a data and AI platform for the hybrid, hybrid cloud, it is built on top of OpenShift. Basically, it is an OpenShift operator. Operator is a special construct that is what installs and sort of monitors the, the, the runtime of um, workloads on OpenShift. So it is an operator, it's a meta operator, if you will, that pulls together different uh, open source projects that are part of the data science workflow, uh, enabling uh, a much easier let's say wiring together and setting up of a data science environment to allow companies to do the kinds of projects that we just went through, but much more easily, right? It gives, uh, it gives the, the folks setting up environments for data scientists um, just a, a leg up, it takes a lot of that sort of configuration and installation, um, uh, both uh, time and, uh, and risk of error off the table. So here in a super, super simplified nutshell is uh, uh, what that workflow look like, looks like and some of the technologies that have been incorporated, right? So you've got data in, let's say, an object type of store such as Ceph or S3. Um, you've got data scientists working in Jupyter Notebooks, um, perhaps using Spark, TensorFlow. They'll run experiments. Uh, the Kubeflow technology um, marries that with the underlying Kubernetes in an efficient way so that um, uh, jobs can be done uh, in that containerized Kubernetes environment. Uh, the workflow to deploy models uh, as a service uh, on OpenShift is, uh, is part of this, um, either in a simple way or a more advanced way with uh, technologies uh, such as Selden. Um, also incorporated our technologies for gathering metrics and storing the results of those metrics. So that's your Grafana and Prometheus uh, technologies like that. So this is what Open Data Hub is doing. It's bringing together these open source projects um, into uh, a coherent, relatively seamless environment to empower data scientists, data engineers, machine learning engineers, all of the stakeholders involved in creating uh, these intelligent applications to give them the environment uh, that they need so that they can do this rapidly with high performance at scale without spending too much time having to do all of the, the tedious and error prone wiring together themselves. So let me end with the following uh, couple of takeaways that I hope you've sensed and as we touched on them in some of these uh, case studies as well as uh, some of the initial setup. The data opportunity will force practically everyone to be hybrid, right? There is the, the, the notion of a walled garden is a fleeting fantasy, right? If anybody is imagining like, oh, I'm just going to go buy a, a, a data science environment off the shelf and set it up and away I go. Um, you know, that that is, uh, things are moving so quickly and enterprises, organizations out there already have so many different technologies in their data centers that um, any kind of monolithic approach to, to data science is just doomed to disappointment. Um, so, so hybrid's fundamental here. With that in mind, anybody setting up infrastructure or data scientists out there who are specifying the requirements of your infrastructure providers um, for such environments, you want to ask for the power of flexibility and adaptability. You want the ability to pull in new technologies to, 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 to connect things in different ways. So whereas um, in Open Data Hub, as I just discussed, uh, some of that is taken off the table for you, some of that wiring together, it shouldn't be walled off, it shouldn't be hidden, it shouldn't be completely black boxed, you need flexibility. Um, and related to that, there should be a balance of opinionated constraints uh, and freedom, right? So, so basically, 
you know, there's that, that that phrase, you know, you know, make the make the simple things simple and make the hard things possible. Um, that's that's what we, that's what you really want to get to here, right? So there is no um, perfectly, um, you know, handheld, you know, can't hurt yourself type of environment, um, but with the right kind of opinionation, the right kind of, um, you know, you know, guardrails, um, you can be made much more efficient and uh, and and be able to roll out data models and machine learning enhanced applications that are scalable and reliable. So I talked about cloud containers, microservices, that stuff's here for a while. So you can very confidently bet on, uh, on a technology like OpenShift, um, you know, the, the, the sheer growth and the, the rate at which that is being deployed out there. Um, you know, that, that's not a, hmm, is this going somewhere or not? It is a, a very dependable foundation. Um, and, you know, when you have the right platform, the right foundation in place, that's going to accelerate your efforts. And then last but not least, as you saw in a couple of the case studies I went through, in order to be successful with these projects, these organizations underwent not just technology transformations, but cultural transformations. They had to change the practices, the behaviors, literally the organizations of their people to make best use of these new technologies and new ways of doing things.